Hello, my name is Joseph Velasquez, and I am honored to be presenting my Corridos Visuales and the Power of the Multiple with you today. Thank you all for attending. I'd like to also thank the members of AFA, the American Printing History Association, for this invite and opportunity to share my experience and my Corrido Visuale with you all. I'm the head of printmaking at Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, prior to this position, I was a co-founder and master printer for Drive-By Press Mobile Printmaking Studio for about 10 years. And that's where I'll start off with my presentation with you, is to give you a little bit of background and history about Drive-By Press and how I was able to integrate some of our activism and community outreach into the larger uh, printmaking community here in South Florida and across Latin America. Uh, my colleague Greg and I, during our thesis year, our third year of graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, we proposed to our graduate committee that we want to mobilize printmaking by putting a press in the back of a vehicle and to drive around local and regional programs, community outreach centers, and different institutions of higher learning to give presentations about printmaking and talk about the history of printmaking. So while at Wisconsin, we learned a lot about the history and industrial influence of printmaking and how we've now translated some of those industrial processes into our now artistic expressions. So my colleague Greg and I were inspired by this and that's what led to us with the mobilization of a printing press that we put in the back of that pickup truck. Now, mind you, this was a 1,800-pound Pelican, Rembrandt Pelican etching press uh, that we would use a boat trailer hitch to kind of lift it up, and we would draw it out. And this enabled us to go to places where printmaking had never been, and we could show up anywhere at any place with a parking lot, and we would find ourselves to an open and susceptible audience. So these weren't academics, these weren't people who were even remotely familiar with printmaking, and they would literally walk up to us and ask if we were making food, they would ask us what exactly we were doing, and it would give us a perfect opportunity to engage with the public about the history of printing. Now, in order to finance this endeavor, many artists donated prints and blocks to us, and we were able to print the blocks on paper that we would sell for donations and it enabled us to continue going. When we would visit schools, it was important us to share contemporary trends in printmaking as well as the historical significance of printmaking and how that has really affected our society. And one of the things that we used to love to tell our audiences was the great influence printmaking had, that it democratized learning and made it everything more accessible. And that's a little bit what of our mission was. That was the impetus of Drive-By Press, is to share. So you see in the images here, we would go around to different institutions and we would hang up work. And it wasn't just our work. Our main work was Drive-By Press. And then we carried about 200 prints that later became 2,000 prints. And we would go and we would give demonstrations to students. We would give demonstrations to different workshops and community art centers. We would also be learning from every host as each school we visited, we would amass more and more prints. Now, mind you, this was something we proposed to our thesis committee to do 13 schools. And after we had made our first initial tour, uh, we exhibited many of the works for our thesis exhibition from the work that we made on the road and the work that we gathered. Now, one of the ways that we funded the operation was through modifying ink with a little bit of dryer and making it with the right viscosity so we can print it on t-shirts, wrap the shirts, and 24 hours later, the people could unwrap, wash, and wear. And we really wanted to affect the ink so it would stay. We didn't want it to wash out. And we created a really strong formula that worked really well for us, but it also tapped into a part of popular culture that really helped finance and really take off of what we were doing with Drive-By Press. And at the time, there were few, if any, people actually printing relief on textiles in this manner. Now, following our thesis exhibition, we were now out of school, and we came to a crossroads as what we do next to Drive-By Press. We had fulfilled our 13 schools for our thesis, 
And when we got home, we had emails from about 65 other institutions that wanted us to come to their schools. So we looked at each other and we decided, well, we just don't want to rush into being adjunct somewhere. So let's keep going. So we did. And we continued to go to school and school. And soon 13 schools turned into 36 schools, which then turned into 72 schools, which now many, many years later, we had visited over 250 institutions across the country, traveling over 200,000 miles across the United States. It was at this time over the summer that we were approached by a marketing agency and asked us if we would be willing to or able to print on an indie rock band tour and making the t-shirts for the bands on this tour that was underwritten by RJ Reynolds. And so working for RJ Reynolds, we got to tour on this big bus. We had to change our entire format. Uh, We were printing three to 500 t-shirts a day and we were printing in front of young kids and people just going to a rock concert. This wasn't something that they had ever seen before. Being mobile the way we were allowed us to kind of change the context of where printmaking can go. As opposed to being in a basement somewhere, uh, we got to take it into a rock venue. And we got to work with different rock bands and work with them about the designs they wanted, work with the management companies. It was all very different from the academic tours, but it was also the range of where we found the idea of drive-by press uh, could lead us. We also have done other works with carving on skate decks and doing stuff at the Vans Warp Tour and other uh, X Game events where we would live print, again, for different marketing companies, and we have found that we can actually carve on skateboards and print them through a relief press using a rubber mat. This also led us to other marketing endeavors and working for Duval Belgianelle and also printing at the Barclays Center for the New York Islanders NHL team. It also led me to meet different and work with different hip hop artists and doing different portraits and stuff and engaging with them and really expanding out of what our normal audience would be. Now, over the time when we first started off, we had our truck that eventually broke down, of course, and then we had our van, and then we got to go on tour, so we have the big, uh, amazing bus, and that allowed us to fund and expand our operations between having a drive-by press operation in New York and a drive-by operation in the West Coast. Uh, This was my press, Junebug. You can see it there with the chain link wheel that adds a lot of street cred. And it also harkens back to my Chicano roots growing up in Pacoima and San Fernando in Southern California. Now, we were contacted by Gamblin Artist Oil Colors, who make amazing printmaking inks. And they wanted to know our formula. And so they flew us out to Portland, Oregon. Uh, We got to work with the engineers there. And it's now marketed the Gamblin Textile Ink. The Gamblin Textile Inc. is working in collaboration with Drive-By Press, and it's sold everywhere now, and it honestly is the most amazing ink. And for us, this was kind of the final feather in the hat with what we were doing. If you look now on Instagram and other social media, you'll see everybody prints relief on fabric. It's part of the culture now in printmaking studios everywhere. It was around this time that I kind of got a little road weary and I was done and I accepted a position here at Florida Atlantic University as the head of printmaking. Shortly after the opportunity and I heard that the next conference was going to be in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in a Puerto Grafico. And this is in 2020. And just a year and a half before we had Hurricane Maria come through and it really decimated Puerto Rico. And there was a concern with the conference about the damage that was there. And they had a call for community engagement and strategy for both increasing diversity and inclusion in printmaking membership during conferences and to take an assessment about our printmakers in need there in San Juan. So I did a site visit with John Hancock, my mentor from undergrad. And I did an assessment of the print shops and resources in San Juan. Uh, From that point, after I came back, we established the Southern Graphics uh, Conference International Ad Hoc Committee for Community Engagement. 
and I was on this committee as the chair, along with Blake Sanders and Hannah March Sanders, two amazing printmakers uh, and activists. Now, during my site visit there in San Juan, I, of course, visit the Liga de Arte, the Escuela de Artes Plásticas y Diseño, and the EAPD. Uh, quite a few individual and privately owned shops and the University of Puerto Rico Ricciento de Rio Piedras. I also visited El Centro para el Grabado en los Artes del Libro, the Center for the Book Arts, and we met Concila Gotoy. And her print shop wasn't so bad as we've seen her uh, presses were in great working order thanks to Paul Moxon. I don't know. I think that Paul Moxon has probably had a hand in more presses across the country or globally than anybody I've ever known. And I'm happy to say that he actually helped me get my SB20 up and running and it's still going, Paul. So thank you. And so if you see Paul, give him a thanks from the printmaking community abroad. Somebody deserves an award. One of the schools that really stood out was the University of Puerto Rico. And there we saw because of the damage of the hurricane blasting through the windows, there was a lot of damage to the presses and their litho press was inoperable. And this was something is like we saw what was coming out and that is the printmaker there in the bottom is Martin Garcia Rivera. And his work, his student work was amazing. And he was really doing the best that he could with what he had. You know, because of the embargo and the constraints in Puerto Rico, they're not able to get the shipment of supplies like we do here stateside. And so whenever I came back from my visit, I included a report that shared what was going on of the print shop needs. And I also included some opportunities for workshop and demonstrations there when the conference would show up to the island. I also established a press repair program for attending members to assist in repairs and equipment who are attending the conference and also local school visits and demonstration and conference admission waivers for local printers. Now, our big initiative when I came back and spoke to the conference and the committee was the Let's Leave a Press campaign in Puerto Rico. And it was my idea that we could create a crowdsourcing for this endeavor. We also had our second initiative, and that was a So Kind registry. And that's a print shop registry for the shops there in Puerto Rico that members attending the conference. And it goes like this. Think of a wedding registry, right? So in my personal shop that I inherited a lot of blankets, I have a whole closet full of blankets. It's a lifetime supply. I don't need this many blankets. What if there was a way that we can find out some of the needs of our familia de tinta there, and we could take some of the items that we had in excess. Maybe somebody needed a spring. Maybe somebody needed something from their press that they had an additional roller, they had an additional screw. They had something that was missing that somebody had in excess. So what if we created a registry where we could connect people to that? And so we started this So Kind registry for that. And it was our hopes that we could do this at every subsequent conference that we have as we move across wherever the conference was going to be held, maybe we can help lift. And again, the power of the multiple. Now, we also established the Puerto Grafico Community Exchange, and we did a call for our members for events and demos in the same manner of drive-by press. So rather than having people come to you, you go to them. And what the design was is that if we're going to a conference and we're going to have so many educators, so many printers there, so many students there, that what if we went out to areas of need and gave presentations on printmaking, maybe just shared work, maybe shared supplies, maybe just gave a demonstration, maybe gave a presentation on the history of printmaking. Now, the Indiegogo campaign for the Let's Leave a Press was built on the idea that we asked printmakers to donate prints from their collection or printers of note to have that we would use as gifts for donations. And we had an, an amazing, amazing engagement with this. Printmakers of note send some amazing prints. And these are prints that they would normally sell for 1500 to 5000 And we were selling them on the registry 
uh, for the gifts for like $150, $200. And you see there, we raised $10,000 in a very short amount of time. Now, we raised close to, I think, $13,000. And Takish Press took up the rest and donated probably close to seven or eight grand, if not more, with shipping. And they donated a brand new giant litho press to the University of Puerto Rico. Now, at this time when the press was in port, it had just been delivered. The conference is happening in 10 days. COVID-19 hit and postponed everything. All the initiatives that we had created, like the school visits, the workshops, the demonstrations, everything was postponed, including the registry where people had signed up, bought their plane tickets, everything, had stuff packed up, shipped some things, but mostly all these registry things were going to be taken by the individual in their carry on. And so all of that was postponed. We didn't get to do any of that. Now, during this time of the lockdown and the quarantine, I kept a dialogue with printmakers in the Caribbean, whether it be in Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and also in Central and South America and Mexico included about what was going on. And I learned a lot through my travels of drive-by press about making do with the best of what you have. And you see there, I made a punk rock roller using a foam roller and a swimming noodle. And I made a roller out of that, a simple hand brayer. I also modified skateboards to make them into presses for students. And I shipped them to uh, Mexico and the Caribbean. I also made an intaglio press out of caster wheels that you can ink up a plate, put the blanket down, rub that little controller over it, and it helps transfer and print. And I also work with Mexican printmakers, Tres Gatos Press, and I modified a traditional tortilla press into a relief printing press. And I began making those and shipping them out. Now during quarantine, I made about 20 of these for my students to check out so they can print at home and still have a similar experience of printmaking in the classroom by being able to do this at home. I also created a YouTube channel where I shared how to make all these things. And that was so important for me, was the ability to share. Now along with traveling with Drive By Press and visiting with artists in Mexico, and in Puerto Rico and in Cuba, I began to amass a collective of Latin artists who have different social backgrounds, have different uh, expressions of their Latin identity. And I was, a, I was afforded the opportunity to curate an exhibition called Corridos Visuales. Now, in my culture, a corrido is typically a, a ballad, a song about a culture clash. And I wanted to include that these artists of the narratives about how we as Latinx artists embrace our identity. And that doesn't mean just, you know, speaking Spanish and being fluid in the culture or making art that is just tied to the culture. Not everybody in this exhibition is doing calaveras. Not everybody in this exhibition speaks Spanish. Uh, not everyone in the exhibition speaks English. But, and it just shows that we are not a monolith. So here are a few images from the exhibition. First, we have Corrido de mi Tata Abuela by Linda Lucia Santana. We have two beautiful Punta Secas dry points from Martin Garcia Rivera from San Juan, Puerto Rico. We have these wonderful images by John Medina. And you see the red one is made out of rice that has been stenciled and printed. And the one on the right is made from beans, frijoles, and stenciled and printed. And we also have the work by Nitsaira Elanor. And this is a giant woodcut that she made about the tradition of braids and braiding uh, in her hair. And then next we have 
Virginia Diaz Psyche. She's from Peru. And she did these wonderful Peruvian uh, masks. And the stamp is to connect her uh, back from her homeland. She now lives in Denver, Colorado. And then next we have amazing Mexico artist, Sergio Sanchez Santa Maria. It's absolutely one of my favorite relief artists uh, alive right now. It's incredible work. And we also have a wonderful Chicana artist, Alicia Smith. Uh, her work often includes a lot of performance. And due to the pandemic, we weren't able to uh, have her perform. Uh, but her work is absolutely so beautiful. And next we have the amazing uh, Cuban-American artist, Martin Mazora. And he did these crazy hands. And when I told him about the studio size, he had an idea of like the wind socks that you would see blowing up at the cell phone stores. And he wanted to uh, create these printed sleeves of arms that represented his tattoos and the narratives that he has on his skin and to be able to relate that. And so um, as you would walk by in the gallery, the motion detector would pick up on that and these things would just boom and inflate up. And then you would just have these crazy hands going as you walk by. And so this exhibition really showed just the range of the um, graphic impact uh, that the Latinos have with printmaking. And that was something that was very important with me, was to share what I've gained through Drive-By Press or my relationships in the Caribbean and Latin America to be able to show that, you know, Rasquache. And so we see here, I have a few of the things to share. And there's my Rasquache sign. But you see the little roller here, and you put the plate down, put the paper on top, and you roll this, and it prints. You get a hell of, a, uh, of an etching print. There's a smaller version of the tortilla press, but you can see. Now, none of this stuff is like, you don't need a degree in engineering to figure it out, man. But it actually works, and it works brilliantly well. Here's another one. This is called the Tiburon. You could uh, print relief blocks and intaglios, collagraphs with this thing. And of course we have here, this is the first model. This is the model A with the skateboard press. And this is just the skateboard that's been modified. And I show this on the YouTube channel on how you use the uh, flexible foam and you create a template and just glue the ends down with masonite. And then you're able to rock that uh, to print. And that's the power of the multiple, being able to share this, being able to share these different ways on making the best with what you got and how it's been beneficial to printmakers of all. Now, I'm hoping that the initiatives that we created with the registry, the workshops, and the idea to help uplift our brothers and sisters in printmaking during conferences, that it's something that can help change all printmaking organizations. And I hope that there are some of these things that we've done and I've shown here that can be employed uh, with APA's ambitions going forward. I thank you all for your time and this opportunity. Again, my name is Joseph Velasquez. Uh, thank you. Spread the ink.